In this lesson, we're going to have a brief overview of the history of communist China. As you go through the video, make notes, and here are some focus questions to help you structure your notes. The first one, what factors helped the communists to win the Chinese Civil War? A uh, second focus question, what was the relationship between the USSR and China like and why? Obviously, you remember that the USSR becomes the world's first uh, communist state back in 1917. And so when China becomes communist in 1949, it adds a huge new nation and its massive population to the communist bloc of the world. So what was the relationship like between these two major communist powers? How much did Mao achieve his goals in the so-called Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution? And last of all, how has China changed and in some ways remained the same since 1980? So let's begin by looking at the Chinese Civil War. From 1927 to 1949, there was a bitter civil war between nationalists and communists, two major groups in China. The nationalists were led by this guy you can see on the cover of Time magazine, Jiang Jishi or Chiang Kai-shek as he's quite commonly known in the West. The communists were led by Mao Zedong, a very charismatic figure and a very efficient organiser. Well back in 1934 the nationalists seemed to be winning. They defeated the communists in one of their bases in the east of China and the communists were forced to undertake something which became a big part of communist propaganda later on, the so-called Long March to Safety in the north of China. Here you can see a photograph of Chairman Mao there. So the so-called Long March, the communists escape to safety in the north when they're near defeat. However, in 1949, the communists sweep to a resounding victory and the People's Republic of China is born run by the Chinese Communist Party. Well, why did uh, the nationalists and Jiang Jishi lose? And why did Mao Zedong win? Let's have a look at some factors. Well, Jiang initially had some American backing, although this decreased as time went on, as the Americans became frustrated at the level of corruption uh, within the nationalist government. The nationalists were not popular. They had a higher le level of taxation and I've already mentioned the corruption. So they weren't well respected, uh, especially by poorer members of Chinese society, such as the peasants who resented the high taxes and the corruption. And most Chinese people were peasants at this time. The uh, word peasant obviously meaning someone who works in the countryside in agriculture. So most, most Chinese people were agricultural workers in the Chinese countryside. And the communists and Mao, they promised something very attractive to the Chinese peasants, and that was a fair share of the land. Uh, the, uh, under the old system, uh, under the imperial system, and under the nationalists, the Chinese peasants would often be working very small plots or have to rent at very high levels of uh, cost. They would have to rent their land from large landlords. So Mao promised basically a fair redistribution of land in China. The Chinese also waged a skillful guerrilla warfare, hit and run. Uh, his tactics would be an inspiration later on to the Viet Cong and to other guerrilla movements worldwide. So in 1949, the weaknesses of the nationalists and the strength of the communists meant that there was a communist victory in 1949 and the People's Republic of China a communist-run state was born. Uh, Jiang Jishi, Chiang Kai-shek, he fled to Taiwan. And actually his uh, government, uh, Taiwan itself, was recognised by the Americans as the actual government of China for, for a couple of decades, actually. The Americans refused to recognise the Chinese communists until about 1970, 1971. So China and the USSR, what was the relationship between these two major communist powers? Well, China had the biggest population of any state on earth and wanted to be seen in its own right as a superpower. They exploded their first atomic bomb in 1964, so they felt that they had many reasons that they should be respected and considered as a major superpower. The relationship with the USSR, though, was not as good as you would expect, considering they both followed 
uh, communist ideology. You think they'd be very friendly. But it was something of a tense relationship. Mao was not impressed with the amount of help he'd received from the Soviet Union during his civil war against the nationalists. And they certainly did not want to be seen as a junior power to the USSR. Yes, the world's first revolution had happened in the USSR, but China didn't feel it should be looked down on as a little brother or a junior partner. So there was the split between China and the USSR certainly worsened after the death of Stalin. Because in 1956, Khrushchev, the successor to Stalin in the Soviet Union, he criticised Stalin in a major way and the personality cult that Stalin had encouraged. You know, the, uh, the massive posters of Stalin everywhere, the huge personality cult. Oh, no, Stalin seen as an almost godlike figure. Well, Mao did pretty much the same thing in China. Um, he hadn't been consulted by the Russians uh, before uh, Khrushchev did his big criticism. And so he was really, really quite upset with Khrushchev and he felt he was too friendly with the West. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the split certainly widened there. And actually, after the invasion of Czechoslovakia, between 68 and 70, they came very close to war. There were skirmishes. There were low-grade combat on the border between the USSR and China. And that poor relationship really lasted until the late 1980s and the gradual collapse of communism under Gorbachev in Russia. Of course, it didn't collapse in China. So let's look at the Great Leap Forward. This started in 1958, and it was an attempt uh, by Mao to change the Chinese economy rapidly, to industrialize this largely agricultural nation. And they did that with things called collective farms, so no more small farms uh, run by individuals. People have to come together in the big district and run collective farms together and factories. Something that else was that really very unsuccessful actually, uh, was something called the backyard furnaces and crop experimentation. I've highlighted here, this is one of the so-called backyard furnaces. And this is the problem that you get in a society where people say what they think the leader wants to hear and are afraid to point out things that are going wrong with the leader's ideas. Actually, Mao had been visiting part of China and he'd noticed one of these backyard furnaces. And the local communist official said, yeah, these things are great. And the people are making steel in their backyards. Mao, who had no idea about metallurgy, encouraged these things to be built in backyards around China. Valuable agricultural tools, pots and pans were melted in these backyard furnaces. Well, the fact is you can't produce high quality steel in a backyard furnace. You need a factory. You need an efficiently run large scale industrial factory. And so what happened is, Lots of people were diverted away from, you know, diverted away from collecting in the harvest into these useless backyard furnaces, which produced very low quality pig iron. Um, crop experimentation was encouraged, but basically there were some fairly bad harvests. People were afraid to report their real crops and harvests to the central government. There was lying and boasting about the amount of crops that had been harvested. Of course, as, we, as I already said, we work, people were diverted away from the harvest with these useless backyard furnaces. And ultimately, this economic mess actually became a tragedy as tens of millions of Chinese people died of mass starvation. So the Great Leap Forward was really anything but. Next, let's look at something called the Cultural Revolution. This started in 1966 and lasted for three years. Mao was getting a bit worried that he was being sidelined by members of the Communist Party. And he felt that the revolution was losing its way. It was becoming perhaps a bit too right wing, not, not radical, not revolutionary enough. And so Mao encouraged something called the Cultural Revolution, where basically young radical Red Guards, mostly teenagers, were encouraged to criticise people who were basically going against the spirit of the revolution. It, mean, it did mean that people in senior positions, doctors, lawyers, teachers, factory managers, were often terrorised by these young Red Guards, publicly humiliated, beaten up and sometimes murdered. 
Well, it did result in removing Mao's opponents, but it also was a fairly horrific period in Chinese history, a very excessive period, <clears throat> and basically a lot of the skillful, uh, educated members of Chinese society were removed, and it basically damaged the economy and damaged the social life of China through the violence of the Cultural Revolution, which did finish in 1979. Well, in 1976, Mao died. And there followed within the Chinese Communist Party a struggle between the radicals, the ones that wanted to keep the very radical spirit of the Communist Revolution alive, and more moderate people who were thinking about ways of perhaps reforming the Chinese economy to introduce some uh, Western style, some Western style capitalism into the economy. Well, a guy called Deng Xiaoping won, and he was one of the moderates. And after Deng Xiaoping won, the, the so called Gang of Four, including Mao's widow actually, very radicals, they were blamed for the excesses of the Cultural Revolution. So there was still the Chinese Communist Party, but they distanced themselves from the excesses the violence and the terror of the Cultural Revolution, and the Gang of Four, including Mao's widow, were imprisoned. And in 1980, China abandoned, essentially, communist economics and encouraged free enterprise. That is, you can basically set up your own business, your, a private business owned by you or a partnership of people, and competition. They did not, however, abandon the rule of the Communist Party, and they did not introduce free speech or multi-party democracy. Let's look at Tiananmen Square event, which happened in 1989. Tiananmen Square is a large square in front of the Forbidden uh, City in Beijing. And there was a pro-democracy movement in 1989, which basically camped out in Tiananmen Square and demanded, basically, democracy. Largely led by students, although other people joined in, they called for free speech and free elections. Well, obviously, the market reforms had been going on for nearly 10 years, so in some ways uh, China had reformed, but they certainly were not ready for this type of protest, this type of reform. And eventually the square was, cl was cleared by tanks and thousands of people were killed as the government clamped down. So a situation of Western style economics with little political freedom. So moving on to 2011, uh, China has gone from strength to strength economically. Uh, with relatively little protest since 1989, perhaps because of the increase in wealth throughout China. It's now a major centre of manufacturing. It's the second largest economy in the world. Uh, the Communist Party still does uh, control the political life of the country. Um, some issues and problems, as there are in every country in the world, a lot of ethnic minorities and questions as there are throughout the world about the future in terms of climate change and so on. So I hope you've got some idea of some elements of the history of communist China and good luck with the quiz.